You may be seated. I would like to have Josh, Sam, and Shmulek come up, and I'm going to introduce them. Come, come on up, if you would, gentlemen. And uh, most of you know Josh Reinstein. Josh is, Josh is one of my best friends. And uh, we've been friends for years and years, and, and uh, every time Scotty and I are doing business in Israel, we get to come over with uh, Josh and Rebecca and their family and have Shabbat at their house. Uh, I, I love this family. They are, they are great, great friends. Josh is the director of the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus in Jerusalem. He's actually from Texas, Dallas. You've been living in Israel how long? 20 years almost. You got a mic? Do we have mics? Oh, right behind you. 20 years, and, and Rebecca is one of the best cooks you've ever met in your life. And their children are just great, great friends. We're going we're gonna to hear from Josh. Sam Grunwerg is the new um, head of Korean Hayazod. He took a great friend of ours place, Moody Sonberg, that went on, and Moody is here, our, our, Sam is here. Um, representing the nation of Israel and Korean Hezot, and he'll tell you that about it. And Shmulek, Shmulek Freed is uh, part of Korean Hezot and the Aliyah Project. We've done things together with Israel. We were just together in Singapore. We're going to be together in Australia. And so uh, these are great, great friends of ours. Would you give them a great <laughs> Dallas welcome around the world? Amen. You saw, uh, we're, we're, I'm, I'm privileged to be on the board of Israeli Ally Foundation. Josh is the president of the Israeli Ally Foundation. And the only requisites of being on the Israeli Ally Foundation is to be extremely good looking. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Luckily for Karen and yeah. I, you saw they didn't have that same uh, prerequisite of the good looking. <laughs> so I was able to sneak right in there. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Larry. Thank you, Tiz. Thank you for this opportunity to be here with you this morning and to address you, to pray with you, and to join together to celebrate Israel, the Jewish homeland and the only Jewish state. I bring with me for all of you greetings and blessings from Jerusalem, the eternal and undivided capital of the Jewish people. Amen. Amen. Again, I want to thank and recognize Pastor Larry Huck, your ministry, the great New Beginnings Church, as you mentioned, the streaming family out there, and it's great to be joined by my friends and colleagues, Josh and Shmulek, and thank you, Pastor Larry, and your ministry and the entire congregation for your hospitality, for opening your doors and your hearts to us, and for your long-standing, rock-solid, unwavering friendship and dedication to the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, until recently, I served as an official Israeli diplomat representing Israel as its consul general in Los Angeles to the entire Southwest United States. And today I stand before you as the new world chairman of Karen Ayasod. I was fortunate and privileged enough to be appointed in both of these positions by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> and Karen Ayasod is one of Israel's historic national institutions, almost 100 years old. And we were established in 1920 when the country was but a dream in the making. Right. And on the way, as the official philanthropic arm for Israel and the Jewish people and our friends of Israel like you from all around the world. And through our work, Karen Ayasod connects Jewish communities with our valued Christian friends like you from all around the globe, together as one family in partnership with all that takes place in the modern state of Israel, bringing Jews home, strengthening the weaker parts and underprivileged parts of society and ensuring unity. So on behalf of the State of Israel and the Jewish people and Karen Ayesod, I want to express to all of you, all of you here today, my gratitude. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. And thank you for your love for and solidarity with the Jewish State of Israel. Amen. 
And thank you, Pastor Larry and Tiz and all of your partners for most recently supporting the Aliyah Project. And I know we saw this on the video recently that the, in the past you've supported the medical center, helped build bomb shelters and safe rooms for children and help care for hundreds of elderly Holocaust survivors. I, I want to call up uh, Pastor Larry, you know, as it says in Isaiah, and he will set a banner for the nations and will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Well, as you know, Pastor Larry, when the prophet used the word nations, he was referring to all of you. And here we are, and 3,000 years later, the prophecy is being fulfilled. And thanks to your help, the Jewish people are being brought back, back home to Israel. Amen. Pastor Larry, I want to present to you a token, a meaningful token of our appreciation. And as you mentioned, it's, I'm giving it to you and to Tiz, but it's for all Amen. of you and all of you watching. This is actually a beautiful, this piece was actually, we mentioned that you supported uh, building bomb shelters and safe rooms. This is made from material from a rocket that was fired uh, wow. towards the South communities with, of course, the, the evil intent of killing innocent Israeli citizens. And it was formulated and turned into this beautiful piece oh, wow. of, you see, eagle's wings. And as you know, the prophecy of the bringing the Jews home on the, on the wings of eagles. Wow. And so this... That's awesome. So I present this to you, and I think this is the, the epitome of sanctifying and take something that was intended for evil and not for good, and elevating it and sanctifying it for good and for protecting Israel, protecting the people of Israel, and bringing our wow. people home. And so thank I say you. thank you. Is that the nation of Israel? That's right. As you see there, as Pastor Larry pointed out, the base is also in, this, in, the, in the form of the map of Israel. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Do this. Take a picture. Come, come Sam. Take a picture so that we can get... Stand up, everybody, so we can get you in the picture. Well, look at Tiz jumping in here. You know... This is for you. This is for you. But I'm putting it in my office. I, I, I wish I could give one to every... This might be a good re replica of this for our television partners. Do you see it? The wings of eagles and the nation of Israel. And that's the prophecy that God would bring the Jewish people back. And the part of the prophecy, and we'll talk about this, is that Gentiles will partner with Israel to bring the Jewish people back to the nation that God gave the Jewish people the land of Israel. So put your hands up. Let's get you in the picture too. Here, Tiz, you get in the middle. We'll put the beauty between the beasts. Thank you, guys. I'm so proud of you all. Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, our shared Judeo-Christian heritage and values are rooted in the ancient system of justice, equality, and liberty. And we see this in the outstanding examples of Abraham, Moses, and King David. And those values permeate the modern state of Israel today. As you know, Israel has achieved extraordinary things in its short time. In just 70 years, we've made the desert bloom. We've become a hub of technological innovation and a multi-ethnic, vibrant democracy governed by the rule of law, the only true democracy in the region. Amen. That's a fact. And you, our Christian friends and supporters, share in these successes and achievements. You know, the dramatic events surrounding the establishment of the modern state of Israel were brought about by the heroism of a remarkable generation. And you are also among the heroes of this story. 
Christians have been among our biggest supporters and allies since at least the founding of the modern state. And your prayers, love, and affection for the state of Israel, the Holy Land, provides us with the strength to continue our mission generation after generation to fulfill God's ancient prophecy and return to Zion. As Ezekiel said in the book of prophets, and I'll say it in Hebrew first, V'lakachti etchem min ha'goyim, v'kibatzti etchem mikol ha'aratzot, v'heviti etchem el admatchem. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Amen. 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 You know, every day, three times a day, we pray for peace with our hearts, our minds, and our bodies, facing the world's holiest city, Israel's eternal undivided capital, Jerusalem. And we pray for peace and prosperity and immense blessings for Jerusalem, for Israel, and for all who call it home. And I want to just say a word about Jerusalem. We are deeply appreciative to you, this faith-based community, appreciative for the U.S.-Israel relationship, appreciative for the president and the administration's decision to move the U.S. Embassy on. and to recognize Jerusalem as the eternal, yes. undivided capital of the state of Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people. Amen. You know, the Jewish people remember Cyrus. King Cyrus of Persia, 2,500 years ago, allowed the Jewish people to go back and rebuild the Jewish temple. You know, Pastor Larry, the Persians today don't remember their own King Cyrus, but the Jewish people remember Cyrus. Right, that's right. And this decision of President Trump will be remembered for generations, for generations and generations to come, and will go down as one of the historic decisions of Zionism. Amen. Amen. 100 years ago, we had the Belfort Declaration, 1917, which recognized the rights of the Jewish people then to a national home in our historic homeland. Then you had the November 1947 decision at the UN to recognize the right of the Jewish people to a state. That was UN Resolution 181. Right. And next, you had the decision in 1948 when it took President Harry S. Truman all of 11 minutes to recognize Israel after its Declaration of Independence right. on May 1948. And I would put the decision of President Donald J. Trump to recognize Jerusalem and move the embassy there in the same rarefied, Come monumental on. Come on. moments Come of modern on. Zionism. Amen. And you were there, Pastor Larry. Yes, sir. Tis. You were there in Jerusalem. You know, there is no people on earth that has a relationship with a city like Jerusalem and the Jewish people. Even when we did not have sovereignty for Jerusalem. For 2,000 years, as a people in exile, we would turn in prayer towards Jerusalem. If you've been to a Jewish wedding, I'm sure you know, the groom stomps his foot and breaks a glass under the wedding canopy. And he and all those present are remembering the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, even on the happiest day of their lives. So we can sum up the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people in three words. Lishana haba biyushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. In English, it's four words. <laughs> but now, thanks to you, the people of Israel can say, this year in Jerusalem. Yes, yes, yes. And we're deeply, deeply grateful for your support of this historically significant recognition. You know, it's more important now than ever to have your prayers and support, especially when we face so many challenges in the chaotic Middle East. The threat from a radical Islamic regime in Iran is not only a threat to Israel, but it's also a challenge to the Christian world and the rule of law and tolerance. And despite all the challenges, Israel will continue to uphold our shared Judeo-Christian values and be a moral compass in a sea of instability. We're helping Syrian refugees fleeing that country's brutal civil war, providing humanitarian and medical care. Israel's proud to be a light in the darkness, and we will continue to stand together with you against the forces of tyranny. 
As the prophet Isaiah said, Leman Sion lo Uleman Yerushalayim lo eshkod. For Zion's sake, we cannot be silent. Right. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Come on. The forces of radical Islam are sweeping the failed states and filling the vacuums of power across an arc of instability stretching from Morocco in the west to Afghanistan in the east. And in this context, the situation in our region for Christians continues to deteriorate. Christian communities are shattered, the holy sites are shamefully desecrated, and entire populations are decimated. And I can tell you that only in Israel, the one true democracy in the region, is this story of decline and despair reversed. Only in Israel, the Christian community has grown more than five times in the past 70 years. <laughs> Only in Israel do Christians in the Middle East have freedom of worship and full access to Christian holy sites where those sites are protected. And only in Israel will a country in the Middle East stand up proudly for Christian heritage at a time where it's being virtually extinguished elsewhere. And we will continue to be the safe haven where Christians are active and valued members of Israeli society, making great contributions in areas of medicine, science, civil society, and high tech. Amen. Yet despite these exceptional achievements, our work is not yet done. The story is not yet finished. Our work in partnership with our Christian supporters and friends is more relevant than ever. And it continues today, and our role continues to be ensuring that the necessary funding is available for critical programs and national priorities, which we at Karen Ayesod, we set those priorities together with the Prime Minister, the Government of Israel, and the Jewish Agency, like bringing Jews from all over the world back home to Israel. Now that Israel is strong and no longer fighting for its daily survival like in its early years, we're thankfully in a different mode. We're not looking to merely survive, but aiming to thrive. We must empower weaker members of society and remember that kol Yisrael arevim zelazeh, we're all responsible for one another. That's right. That's right. And at Karen Ayesod, we are helping Israelis of all ages and from all aspects of society from at-risk youth and children, all the way through providing sheltered housing to the elderly. And Karen Ayesod, of course, builds a strong Israel as a refuge for those Jewish communities around the world who are unsafe and persecuted and victims of anti-Semitism. But thanks to your help, they can leave that all behind and go home, home to the land of Israel, their ancestral homeland. Amen. Karen Ayesod throughout its history has helped over three million olim, or new immigrants, settle in Israel through a multitude of programs. And I know of what I speak because reflecting on my own dreams and my own story, I grew up in South Florida and I had the privilege to make Aliyah or to immigrate to Israel almost 30 years ago. And I'm a living example of the Zionist dream. So now, being able to help these new immigrants to fulfill their dreams and the prophecy, I'm incredibly blessed and great, grateful to be a part of this effort, and I'm sure that you are too. So we know that you, representatives of millions of our Christian supporters throughout the United States, will continue to stand up for Israel through your prayer, through your actions, for light over darkness, truth over lies, and hope over despair. We must speak up, we must stand tall, as you've done with great faith, courage, and moral clarity. So on behalf of the State of Israel, I say thank you. Todah rabah. And I want to especially thank you as the faith-based community and the devout Christian community in the United States. Know how thankful we are for your support. But we must keep engaging. I ask all of you to continue to stand with Israel in your community, Boycott, divestment, and sanctions is an abhorrent anti-Semitic movement. And you have bravely stood up with us shoulder to shoulder against it, and we need your continued support.
Just this past Friday, the great, this great state of Texas once again stood up against these efforts to boycott and single out Israel by updating and blacklisting another company trying to do so. And I applaud you for that. Israel applauds you for that. Yes, amen. America and Israel will continue to stand together for our common civilization and our shared values. As it says in Genesis 12, 3, about our father Abraham. Those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse her will be cursed. So God bless you, Pastor Larry. God bless you, Tiz. God bless all of you, the New Beginnings Church. God bless the state of Israel, and God bless the United States of America. Toda Rabbah. Amen. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. God bless. Come sit. Come on, you sit here. Sam, you sit here. And I told uh, Josh and Sam and Shmulek, uh, you don't have to worry about being politically correct in this organization. We're more concerned about being biblically correct in this congregation. And so I want you guys to be free to respond politically and spiritually. What what the politics are of it, what the Bible says about it, um, because they go hand in hand right now. Politics and the Bible uh, are synonymous. Um, Tuesday, we do our filming for television on Standing with Israel in the studio. Uh, Thursday, Tiz and I will be in the White House. We've been asked to come to the White House to talk about the peace process in Israel. And when I come out of that meeting on Thursday evening, we're doing a uh, conference call that was already set up with uh, Representative King from Texas and hundreds of pastors in Texas about standing with Israel and coming against the uh, BDS uh, uh, movement that is uh, uh, anti-Semitic. So a couple things. Um, Years ago, when I first started going to Israel, I was in Paris, and we were right across from the Louvre, and we we're in a souvenir shop, and I said to a friend of mine who was Jewish that was traveling with us, uh, we were looking at something, and I didn't want the lady from Paris to know we were talking, and so I said, Gamazerle, and uh, the little girl says, you guys speak, he are you Jewish? And she began to tell us, this was in Paris, and this was the beginning of me understanding anti-Semitism. I thought it was dead. I thought, you know, we've learned our lesson through World War II. Surely anti-Semitism isn't out there today. And she began to tell, she said, I, we said, we're on our way to Israel. We're going to Israel for, with a group. She said, would you pray that someday I could move to Israel? And she told the story of her father and grandfather every Friday afternoon preparing for Shabbat they have to take their, their money and jewelry and put it in a bank because Jews were getting robbed on the Sabbath on the way to the synagogue on the way home. And I said, surely this, this can't be true. So why is it important that as Christians, we not only stand with the nation of Israel, but we help these Jewish people around the world, whether it's Paris or Ukraine or Ethiopia, we help them fulfill the Bible prophecy of moving to Israel. Assembly just put Airbnb on the list of companies not to work with because of their uh, horrible decision to boycott Judea and Samaria. And right away, you got Jason Witten back on the Cowboys. So it's like a direct, direct it's a blessing. Day. It's a good day. Very exciting. Josh, but, maybe explain what what BDS is, because maybe a lot so of people don't understand what. That I is. think to understand European anti-Semitism. Uh, 
Charles Krauthammer, who passed away, Love Shalom, said it best. He said, it's the, the real shock isn't that there's anti-Semitism again in Europe. The real shock is that they've been able to suppress it for 70 years. And really, there's always anti-Semitism there. And the BDS movement is this idea to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel, and to put uh, you know, all this pressure economically on Israel to try to destroy Israel. And, and this isn't a new concept. This is the same uh, idea of, of Nazi Germany, the Nuremberg Laws in the 30s. All they did was change the word Jew to Israel. So they say, don't buy things from Jews in the 30s. Now they say, don't buy things from Israel. Don't let Jewish professors come and teach in your universities in Europe. Don't let Israeli professors come and teach in your, your, in your, in your universities. They say that we were doing blood libel in the 30s. They said that we were, we were taking Christian children and taking their blood and using it to make matzah. Today they say we poison Palestinian children with candies, the same blood libel. Uh, they called us the wandering Jew, that we'd come into their countries and take over. Now we're coming into the country of Israel and taking over. Like, there's no other people in the world that have a greater claim to the land than the Jewish people to Israel. Right. Yet we're in someone else's country taking over. So, Josh, it, as you're going to, how many times is Jerusalem mentioned in the Quran? Zero. Yeah. Uh, zero. And it's only hundreds of times, over 600 times in, in, the, in the Torah. And, and, and really, this is just the same anti-Semitism. And what's so amazing is that this time around, we're not alone. You know, there's that whole thing, we're not going to be alone. And we thought, okay, as Jews, we thought we're going to be alone. You know, we're, we're going to have to do so, but we're not. It's, it's Christians like you who are getting their state senators and the state governments to, to go after the people who are doing this anti-Semitism. And, and Texas is just the second city... Uh, second state to put Airbnb on that list, but there's going to be dozens now because Texas is leading the way on this issue. And, and what's amazing uh, about, about this is that we're really seeing Christians, not countries, who are standing with Israel. And it's so important, and this is to answer your question from the beginning, why should Christians get involved? Well, because you're next. Right. They say first the Saturday people and then the Sunday people, and and and, and they're <laughs> coming right. after you. And so if you don't if, stop it here, it's going to go there. If I can just add to that, and then Sam, you respond. The uh, deputy commander in Iran just a couple of days ago made a public statement that said we will destroy uh, the U.S. and we will destroy Israel globally to wipe their filth from the face of the earth. So this is not just, oh, we don't like you. There's a strategy, like you said, Saturday first, Sunday next. You can go on their foreign ministry website. That's actually their foreign policy. Yeah, that's the foreign That's right, yeah. and, and, and our prime minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said, our people, we have a history when, when, when leaders of the world call to annihilate us, we take those threats seriously. But thank God, and with your help, we now are able, with the sovereign Israel, to defend ourselves by ourselves. Thank you. I want to add to what Josh said on that point, Pastor, and you asked about this boycott effort and why it's anti-Semitism and how it relates to Europe today. You know, my colleague, who's our Israeli ambassador to the United States, Ron Dermer, he and I talked about this, and he explains it this way. Why is this boycott movement, why is it anti-Semitism? Well, he says if, if uh, an institution, an academic institution, or even some church institutions out there want to join these efforts to boycott Israel, and, they, and they'll come to him or they'll come to me as a former Israeli diplomat, and I'll say, well, the first question I'll ask them is, well, what number am I on the list? What number is Israel on the list of countries that you want to boycott? Because if there is a list and I'm number 32 or 42 or 62, well, at least there may be some principles behind it, and I need to do a better job of explaining to you why you have it wrong on Israel. But when the answer is, there is no list. It's just Israel. That's the singling out of Israel. Just Israel. And the singling out of Jews. And Well, historically, we have a name for singling out Jews just for being Jews, and that's called anti-Semitism. That's right. And so today, singling out Israel just for being Israel, it's the same thing. It's anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, that's what we're experiencing. You mentioned Europe. We just witnessed, unfortunately, last week, the chief rabbi in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. He and his wife, there was a, a home invasion. 
and they were robbed and beaten, but the first thing they said to him is that we know that you're the uh, chief rabbi and the most important rabbi here in the country. So unfortunately, that same anti-Semitism is alive and well. You know, before there was a state of Israel, they, um, they would tell the Jews in Europe, go to, they would say Palestine because it was before Israel. They would tell them, go, go back to Palestine. Now that there's an Israel, there's an effort to deny any connection, historically or otherwise, with Jerusalem, with the land of Israel, and they're saying, go back to Europe. So we see this same anti-Semitism today, but as Josh said, thank God we have your support and we have the sovereignty and ability to stand up for ourselves and to speak for what's true. Amen. Amen. Sh Shmulek, I think it's, it, it is hard for a lot of Gentiles to understand how strong anti-Semitism is. When we were in Singapore, uh, you told us that riding a train or being, and something with you on the way to the synagogue, you, you, you have to hide your, tell that story. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you, Pastor Larry and Tease for having me over here today with you. I, I'm so excited that I may forget some of my English, but coming all the way from Jerusalem and physically, I'm watching you on Facebook and television and seeing you alive so far away from Israel. I'm so grateful for everything that you do for your day-to-day -day prayer and support for the state of Israel. Amen. Um, thank you. Due to my job, I have to do a lot of traveling. And you know, one of the things that my wife is uh, forced me to do is that uh, I hate taking off my kippah, my yarmulke away. I go to sleep with that and I wear my yarmulke every day, all day. That's how, I, that's how I live. This is my identity as a Jew. And, my, and when I travel in the US or Singapore or other places, I don't take it off because thank God, Baruch Hashem, I don't feel any threat. The only place where my wife is telling me, you are not going, you are not going, if you're not taking off your kippah, is in Europe. And I have a friend who made like, he wanted like to, to see whether it's true. And he went in the street of France with his kippah and people starting, random people suddenly started to spit on him and to curse him from no reason, not knowing who he is, just identifying him as a Jew. As, uh, as a grandchild for a Holocaust survivor, it is very, very uh, difficult for my grandmother who went through Auschwitz for six months to hear that we are actually repeating the history over 70 years and we are still in the same place. Jews need to hide their Jewish identity. I have no doubt that you know all of it. It's something, it's a message that God is sending us and we have to look on ourselves and to and to identify what is the message. But what is clear for me, you know, um, a month and a half ago, we, um, we marked the International Holocaust Memorial Day, where uh, um, Hitler was trying to destroy the Jewish nation. And a little, a little le less than a month from today, we will be celebrating the Purim Festival. Same story, Haman trying to destroy the Jewish people. Not Haman, not Pharaoh, not Hitler, none of them yeah. managed to fulfill their dream of destroying the Jewish people. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I believe that anyone, anyone who is trying to destroy the nation of Israel will be destroyed himself at the end of Amen. the day. Amen, exactly what the Bible says. Josh, I think it was you told me the story you were going to the synagogue in was it in Holland? Norway. Norway. Tell that story. Yeah, it was a, a real shock for me because I didn't realize how far it's gone in Europe. But I was going to, walking to the synagogue, and they were politely trying to tell me that I should take off my kippah on my walk to the synagogue. And I said, I, I didn't even understand what they were talking about. I'm like, why? You know, it was the security guard pointing at your head, right? Or, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> or, I, I thought maybe there was the, you know, for, the web was going to blow off or something like that. But, but they said that you, you can't walk. You can't walk the streets of Oslo with a keep on your head. And, and that was a given. That wasn't something that they thought, OK, maybe it wouldn't be good or not. No one does that. And, and that's what's happening in Europe. And, it's, and again, to, just to reinforce what I said before, 
it's a pattern. It's, it's, it's the real anti-Semitism of the 30s, because if you look at what they're trying to do now, they're labeling goods from Israel again in Europe. The EU has a directive that if you have a product that was made in Jerusalem or Judea and Samaria or the Golan Heights, you label it. It's just like the yellow star was in the, in the 30s. Exactly. But it's even crazier because just like Sam said, they're not labeling all the conflicts in, in the world. They're not even labeling the ones just from the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. They're not even labeling just the one side, the Israeli side. Israeli Arabs don't have to label their goods. Only Jews, only Israeli Jews have to label their goods. And that is a completely acceptable European regulation. And so it's gotten to such a point that you can't wear your kippah in the streets, you, you can't be proud of, of your heritage, and, and it's, the, it's the coming back of that, that virus of anti-Semitism that just spreads with no explanation. You know, I think one of the things that... Uh is is hard for us unless we're educated is to understand and I think one of you guys said this this is not a this is not a new thing you, people won't say they're anti-semitic but they hide behind the label of being anti-israel and the things that are happening with like the phone call that we're doing on Thursday is to stand against in Texas to rally pastors around Texas to stand against the BDS movement. And the BDS is boycott, diverse, and sanction. As one of you said, it's the same thing that Hitler did. It started in 19, I think the first one was 1933, when they said, we want you to boycott in Germany all Jewish businesses. And then they put the SA, the stormtroopers, the brown shirts, in front of Jewish businesses to intimidate Gentiles from doing business with the Jewish people. That same intimidation is coming across politically. That They may not be standing with brown shirts, but they're standing in Congress. They're standing in the Senate. They're standing, unfortunately, in some churches. And they are calling for a destruction of the Jewish people, just like it started. Nazi Germany didn't start with the gas chambers. Nazi Germany against Jews started with the boycotting of Jewish businesses, bankrupting them. Anti-Semitism has a new label. It's called anti-Israel. Would you, would you agree? And so we're, that's what we're doing on Thursday is, it, and by the way, the, uh, what is it, CARE, the uh, Council for American Arab Islamic, Islamic is, is going to stand war against us on this, but it's interesting that they're saying the way Texas goes is the way the rest of America will go. That's why we need, y'all need to pray for us on, on Thursday because they're saying the way Texas goes is the way America will go. You know, the process you're seeing here in America is basically where Europe was 10 years ago. It used to be that in Paris, they'd chant death to Israel, but today they've pretty much pulled the mask off. They're saying death to the Jews again. I mean, yeah. it's really that bad. I, I was in Tübingen, which is where a lot of the people in Germany came together for the final solution. It was where a lot of the universities were there about 10 days ago at a conference where the, the ancestors of Nazis were apologizing for the Holocaust. And the mayor didn't show up because he thought it would be controversial if he went to it. I mean, can you imagine how crazy the, this is? And in America, it's just the beginning of this anti-Israel thing. And, and what they're doing, CARE and the ACLU and some of these leftist organizations are saying, this is not a racism thing, it's a freedom of speech issue. You should be allowed to boycott whoever you want. And it's true, you can boycott individually, but as a state, as a government, you need to stand against hate violence and racial hate and, and of all forms. Uh, and, and this is exactly that. It's just anti-Semitic hatred of Jews. I have gone to, Sam, I'll let you know, I have gone into businesses in Israel in, in the, uh, the uh, territories that they're trying to boycott businesses and spoke to Arab men and women 
and secretly saying, we cannot have these factories, these businesses shut down. This is how we make our living. I've been in factories that the companies will build them a room that they can go however many times a day as Muslims to go in and pray. There is no, they and the Arab, the Palestinian people love the business. And when those businesses got shut down, they lost all of their income. You're right. There, there are well-known cases. Uh, there's a good example. is a company called SodaStream, which employed uh, hundreds, if not more, uh, Palestinians. And it was actually a great model for coexistence. And by pushing forward these boycott efforts, uh, besides everything we mentioned in terms of being anti-Semitic and anti-Israel, it actually hurt these Arab Palestinians and worked against coexistence and against peace because they're not really, those that are the proponents of boycott, they're not really about peace. They're only about one thing, which is the end and the destruction and dismantling of the state of Israel. So that's why when I thank you for the support, it's calling it out for what it is because this boycott, as we mentioned, if if they were boycotting Israel among many other countries with, uh, then like I said, we can at least engage and explain why they're wrong. With regimes out there, we know what North Korea, Venezuela, Syria, Iran, and you're singling out Israel, where we value human rights, women's rights, religious rights, you name it, and you're singling out Israel, well, you have to hold a mirror up to their faces and say, this is hate, and this is anti-Semitism, and we have to put an end to it. Amen. Um, first of all, it's, it's so true what you said. The first one to be affected if the, when they do boycott against company in Israel will be the Arab, which is ridiculous to boycott and, and to hurt their own their, the population, the Arab population. Second of all, you know, uh, Israel, due to anti-Semitism, hide a lot of their technology when we sell our technology around the world. And I shared before with Pastor Larry that I actually think that we need to do the completely the opposite. Yes. We actually need to mark Israel on each and one of the technology that we send to the world so the world will realize how much blessing and what is our role here Amen. in the world. Absolutely. If you go today into your GPS or into your phone or into your computer, everywhere you go in hospitals, we bring so much good. You know, Africa, uh, full with uh, natural resources, but unfortunately suffering from so much poverty over there. And Israel is managing all the time to make the life in Africa much and much better. Finally, to get clean water. People in Africa are still walking, going into the river to get, to get water, only four hours away from Israel. So the purpose of Israel in the world at the end of the day is to bring good by boycott Israel at the end of the day, it's only going to come back to the people who are trying to hurt us. I'll yeah. tell you, Pastor Larry, there's, there's also reason to be optimistic because there is quite a revolution going on today. Absolutely. Despite, and don't get me wrong, everything that we just mentioned, the situation in Europe and other places, anti-Semitism, it's very serious. But at the same time, in our part of the world, there's a revolution going on in terms of the realignment of interests. Uh, with uh, many Arab Gulf states that don't have formal diplomatic relations with Israel because of the shared common threat of Iran, but mostly because of what, what Shmuley just mentioned, because of what Israel has to offer the world. We can help, it comes down to two things. We can help countries feed their citizens and protect their citizens. The Prime Minister talks a lot about technology, the two T's, he calls it, technology and fighting terror. We help countries through our technology, whether it's agriculture, um, self-automated vehicles, you know, Mobileye, this uh, company of self-automated vehicles was just uh, sold for, um, to, to Intel. And agriculture, medical innovations, and countries realize that Israel is part of making the world a better place and not part of the problem, and they're seeking us out. In many ways, in so many ways. I think it's also very important to mention, because. You know, we've been working for 15 years to build what we call faith-based diplomacy, and that's the idea of Jews and Christians working together to support the state of Israel, to, to defend our shared Judeo-Christian values, 
Our uh, former speaker, who's now our president, Ruby Rivlin, once said, there are a billion Christians and 13 million Jews, but together we're a billion 13 million. Yeah, that's and, right. and that was really the idea behind the that's movement. Right. Well but uh, what we have to, to say, and because we're talking about some very heavy and, and, and horrible issues, is that last year, for the first time in the last 15 years I've been involved in at least, we're finally winning. Yeah. And we're kicking butt. Yeah, same we, we got the embassy in Jerusalem. Amen. We got 27 states that outlawed BDS, which makes it uh, financial BDS impossible. How are you gonna how are you gonna boycott Israel if you're a serious company and you can't do business with Texas or New York or California or, or Florida? It's three and a half trillion dollars off the table, and and that's all part of this faith-based diplomacy. And and I, I know that that Larry is, is modest when he talks about this, but that's why it's also important his involvement in the Israel Allies Foundation because that's what we do. And his voice has been instrumental in all these things happening over the last 15 years. It's an incredible, it's a credible turnaround. And I want to just add to that, to those amazing achievements, is also the decision by the president and the administration to pull out of the Iran deal. Oh, yeah. And I know that this faith-based Amen. community Amen. supported and supports that decision. And you should wear that with a badge of honor. Yes. And we thank you for that. Amen. And I also want to add, I believe that's part of, a big part of the reason why we are winning, it's because of you. It's because the Christian people today really, really stand with the state of Israel. And you know, we are the Jewish people, we are not that naive. We are so grateful for the President of the United States moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Amen. But we also know, we also know that the people who push them to make the decision, it's you, the Christian people in the United States. Amen. And we are very much indeed grateful for all of you for this. I want you all the, to respond to this, and I'm going to tell a story in that, in how important is it to the world and to the Jewish people to see Christians standing? And, and I want to precede that with, I don't know, I'm sure you remember, Josh, but a year or so ago, we were presenting one of the ICU units, the, the, the mobile uh, intensive care unit. Uh, we've done, you've done five now that are saving lives, and not only Jewish lives, saving Palestinian lives, Christian lives, all kinds of lives. And they had us do a presentation at the Jaffa Gate. And uh, while we were there, there were people from the museum there and from the city standing there that weren't part of the ceremony watching. And we saw people crying, Jewish people crying. And uh, they came up after the ceremony was over and said, thank you for being a blessing to Israel. That night we were with you and Rebecca for Shabbat. And I remember saying, why were they so moved? I mean, we're just buying these, these ambulances, these ICU units. Why were they so moved? And I think it was either you or Rebecca said, and this really had impact in my life. They said, we have felt alone for a long time. It feels so good to know we have friends. And that made such an impact on me because we don't know what that feels like. And to see these people, and for you or Rebecca to say that, made such impact on me. Wow. What would it feel like to feel like you're fighting this for 2,000 years all by yourself. How important is it to the Jewish people, to the world, to see Christians making a stand with the Jewish people, nation of Israel? Maybe I'll start with sure. your permission. So I'll, I think I'd like to answer that a couple ways. You know, first of all, we talk a lot about the close U.S.-Israel relationship, the close, as Josh just mentioned, also, also our relationship with you, our Christian friends, the faith-based community. You know, we talk about shared values and shared interests, Judeo-Christian uh, values that we share, and it's true. But it's a lot more than that also. It's not just shared interests and shared values. It's a shared destiny yes. and a shared sense of destiny. Well put. Because we're not just about interests and values. We, we are a cause. Together we are a cause. And I think that it runs so deep. You know, part of the blessings of having reestablished the modern state of Israel, it's really three things. It's one, it's having a voice again, having a place of refuge, and also 
uh, having a, a shield and a sword to be able to protect ourselves. And having that voice, as you mentioned, Pastor, that for I'm also a grand, grandchild of Holocaust survivors ho and victims of the Holocaust. And we did feel so alone for so long. And to now have your blessings and your support, that's why those people were crying. And that's why if I were there, I probably would have had the same reaction. Because together with your support and your prayers, we're able to fulfill the prophecy and we're able to once again have a voice, be a place of refuge for those communities, whether it's in France or Argentina or other places in the Ukraine, to be able to help the Jews come back. You know, there was something called the White Papers when the Jews were being persecuted in Nazi Germany and Nazi Europe. And there were Jews that were, were on boats on their way away from those uh, gas chambers. And they were turned around and sent back. And many of them perished. Well, those days are over. Thank God and thanks to you. And so thank God with those blessings, we're able to do that. And that's why it's so deep and we're able to, to share that sense of unity. Amen. Amen. I also just think that it's, it's such an amazing thing to see the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We knew that one day there was going to be a, a nations that stand with Israel. We didn't know we were going to see it in our own lifetime. And, and you, you'd hear about people in the Christian community talking about being grafted into the covenant. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't it mean it's just an abstract concept, or are we really together? Yeah. yeah. And, and to see it being fulfilled before our eyes is something that we never thought we, we, we were going to see. We thought we would have to have faith and maybe one day in the future, but this is happening right now, and it's, and it's a real thing. And not only is it real, it's been blessed by God's hand to the point that it's so powerful. The faith-based diplomacy today is the most important weapon in our diplomatic arsenal. It's why we have support with the Christian bloc in Africa. It's why all these countries in Latin America are moving their embassy to Jerusalem. It's why we have the anti-BDS legislation in America. You know, we made a list five years ago of the top 10 things that America could do for Israel. And, and we said, you know, as a board, we said, if we could get one of those 10 things to happen in the next 10 years, we would have done, we would have done all right. And Donald Trump in the last 12 months have done six of those 10 yeah. things. Six. Right. And it's not because he's running for president in Israel or he's trying to really help the Israelis. It's because he made a commitment to you that he would do those things. Yeah. And he's the first president that actually keeps his commitments. And so it's really unbelievable to see the power of faith-based diplomacy. And, and, and it's what God said was going to happen, and we're living. We're part of it. We get to be a part of the story. Yeah. I think that uh, well it's even more than, more than important. This is really the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. You know, as, as a child, Sam mentioned Isaiah. And it says, I will raise a banner for the nation. So in school, we were studying this verse, I will raise a banner for the nation, and we went through. Never knew who is the nations. And today, it's so clear for me who are the nations. And it's written in the Bible. We actually didn't come up with this startup. It was prophesied 3,000 years ago that the nation will stand up with Israel. And you know, Pastor Larry came to our conference in Singapore as the, as the keynote speaker. 40% of the people who come to our conference in Singapore, do you know where they come from? Two very interesting countries, Indonesia and Malaysia. Yeah. One of the, Indonesia, the, big, the largest Muslim country in the world. Isn't it a miracle that we have people from Indonesia coming to stand with Israel? So for me, all of it, it's a clear sign that we are living today in a time when biblical prophecy is become into a reality. And God is watching us. He wants to see what are we going to do with that? Are we going to stand aside? Are we going to take an action? This is what I believe. You know, I, I want to add something. Shmulek is the guy, when I came back from Singapore and, and we presented from you at the conference in Singapore, a check for a million dollars, and we, we all went out to, to dinner, and I said, what's next? And Shmulek said, well, we have these Ethiopians that we have to get in by, by January. And I came back and told them, I said, I was 
saying what's next for next year. I didn't mean what's next tomorrow. <laughs> and because of you, we raised another $200,000 and brought 1,000 Ethiopian Jews back. And he's the guy. He's the guy. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And thank you. But, you know, you mentioned the Ethiopian. Imagine yourself, which nation in the world will do such a thing? The Ethiopian who comes to Israel come from a third world country. They live in a house, they call it tukul. It's made from mud and, and, and from bushes. And they come, they want to have their food, they're going to hunt, to hunt their food, or they go to the river to bring water. Why should a country like us would bring them? You saw the video that we sent them. We bring people from 90 years old and even more to a few months. Only in Israel such a things can happen. Oh, only in Israel. I can, I can remember, and I want to say one more thing and ask your, ask your advice on this, but I'll just t tell one story. When we first started going to Israel, I've been to Israel now 34 times. When we first started going to Israel, we were shocked because, because I had no idea what I was going to see. We were shocked to see so many different colors of people in the nation of Israel. And I always say this, I was with Tiz when this happened. We were checking in to the hotel right by Ben Yuda Street, uh, right up from the, the, the David Citadel. I can't remember what, it, what hotel it was then. And there was this l young woman checking us in, and I was with Tiz. She was as black as black could be, one of the most beautiful young women I've ever seen in my life, huh? She was strikingly, her skin was strikingly beautiful, her eyes, and t I was with Tiz. <laughs> and I said, where are you from? And I think she was Ethiopian. I can't remember for sure. And I said, Tiz says, why are you here? And she goes, I'm Jewish. This is the land God gave us. And it was the beginning of my journey to realize how diverse Israel is in welcoming everybody back to the land that God gave. We talked about, we talk about Aliyah, and I want all of you here and all of you praying around the world, I want to raise another, uh, I want to get us up to $2 million for Aliyah as soon as we possibly can. Uh, so I want you to pray about helping bring, what, what do we say, we, one flight is, Margaret, Martha, how would one flight is 790? 750 for one person. And so we know how important it is to bring the Jewish people to fulfill the prophecy of Gentiles partnering with Israel to bring Jewish people. When we were there for the dedication, um, we saw people, we were coming up in special buses, people lining the streets, cheering, thanking that we brought the embassy to Jerusalem, acknowledging Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. But we're not done yet. Just, and if you, I'm, I'm gonna be in Washington, Tis and I'll be in Washington Wednesday. The next thing we need to deal with is no divided Israel and no divided Jerusalem. Because, amen? Amen. amen. And what you need to understand is if, if they divide Israel, the defenses, we lose the ability to defend. If they divide Jerusalem, every Jewish and Christian holy site goes into the hands of the Muslims. The last time that happened, they turned our churches into toilets, into latrines. They, turned, they tore down our synagogues. They turned them into stables and, and for cattle and animals. How important is it that we have no divided Israel and no divided Jerusalem. Well, I think that the whole idea of dividing the land of Israel is a complete scam. First of all, man can't divide what God has united. That's the first one. Well put. Secondly, since 1911, we've divided, divided the land of Israel 22 times. It has led to nothing but death and destruction. It doesn't work. It's a proven thing. To do it a 23rd time... And if I may out. add, and it's not 
the land of Israel today is not the same thing as was given to them no. at the Balfour Declaration. No, it's, Correct? It's, it's, been, it's been chopped up, I said, 22 different times. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable that we keep going to that solution. And it doesn't make sense. The land of Israel and landmass is the size of a pack of matches on a football field compared to the landmass of the Arab countries around us. So they said that if you cut that pack of matches in half, there's going to be peace. Of course, that makes absolutely no sense. Okay, it, it, but paint that picture again. So you have, you a, have football a football field. field. That's the landmass of all the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Libya. That's, that's all of the Arab countries around us. That's the size in relation to Israel. Israel's like a pack of matches on that. And they're saying if you cut your pack of matches in half and give it to the Arab world, you'll have peace. It doesn't make sense practically. And the, and the real scam here is that this issue is always packaged as a political issue. But it's not. It's no. a biblical issue. That's this not. is a real biblical issue. And they try to confuse it. They try to confuse the issue by saying, oh, no, no, we, we're going for a political solution. But the reason they try to divide Jerusalem, and we know this, is because in order for the Messiah to come, it has to be in Jewish hands. It has to be united Jerusalem. We have to rebuild Jerusalem. And the other side knows that too. And, and again, I'm Jewish and I believe the Messiah is coming for the first time and you believe the Messiah is coming for the second time. We both want him to come today. And he's not coming if we divide Jerusalem. And, we, and, and, and that's the goal. We, we, may, we, we, we joke with each other all the time. Is he come, if he comes the, is he come the second time or if he comes the first time, we'll ask him, do you, do you need us to show us around? Because I've been there 34 <laughs> times. But one thing, we're, one thing we're totally in agreement in is where he's coming to. That's right. And that is an undivided Jerusalem. Unbelievable. I'll, I'll just add, you know, it's... Obviously, the issue of Israel in the Middle East is complicated, but this is actually pretty simple. The reason we don't have peace today is the refusal to recognize the right of the Jewish people to have a nation state, a sovereign land in their ancestral homeland. And that's why our detractors have tried to lie and deny any connection between the Jewish people in Israel and Jerusalem. It's, it's not only fake news, it's fake history. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And so that's why the move of the embassy and recognizing Jerusalem, it punctured that lie. And it didn't just advance truth, but it actually advanced peace. You know, the younger generation today, does, myself included, doesn't remember, you know, those that are, let's say, uh, 50 and younger don't remember uh, a weaker Israel uh, or the first 18 or so, 19 years of the state of Israel between 1948 and 1967, before Jerusalem was liberated in 1967. As you mentioned, Pastor Larry, the Jews did not have access to our holy sites, and the Christian sites were not protected. And so we know that that does not work, and the, Jerusalem must remain the undivided eternal capital of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. Undivided. First of all, I want to say exactly as uh, Josh said, this is not in our hands to decide. God gave us the land of Israel. You know, it was almost, yes, almost happened that we ended up in Uganda, but we ended up at the end of the day in Israel. So it's, it's not in our hands to decide which part of Israel to give up. God gave us this land, the holy land, and we cannot make any decision to give up on any on each and one. Number, number two... Um, we're not that naive, yes? Don't buy it that if we give up a specific part of the land of Israel, a peace will begin. It's not gonna happen. We ended up, we gave up on Gush Katif, unfortunately, on Gush Katif, and now we're getting the rocket in Tel Aviv. So don't give up, don't buy this uh, story that if we give up anything, we will get peace in return. We're gonna get more fire. I, I would also just add that this meeting on Thursday that you're attending, and I know that only 20 uh, Christian leaders nationwide were invited to this meeting to meet with the president on this issue, is probably one of the, the turning points in this battle for Jerusalem and Israel proper. Because there's a lot of people around the president saying, you can go along with this peace plan, and you know people are going to love you, and you're going to get a Nobel Peace Prize, and it's going to be celebrated. Uh, but Donald Trump wants to make sure if he does that, will the Christian base still support him in 2020? And, and if you give him a strong position that if you want Christian support, you got to stand by biblical values, by the, what it says in the Bible, and not divide the land, he's not going to divide the land. So I think 
May God give you courage for a time of this to, to go before the king and explain that, that this is a critical issue for Christians all over the, the nation. And I'll just add what's important in this part of that message, which I know that you and your community and your faith-based community stand behind, is the message that Israel is in Jerusalem and these, the Jewish people are in the land of Israel, not just by might, but by right. Right. Exactly. By the right of God. Amen. Amen. One last question. What's the message Tiz and I take to Washington? I think that the message is to, to be strong and, and to, to have courage because there are many people who have fallen for this scam that if you go along with this peace process, you're going to have success and wealth and, and, and power and you're going to show you're a world power in, in the community. But all those people who have gone by the peace process, they're all gone. All the leaders of Israel who went by the peace process are gone. Maybe they passed away or had to retire or went to prison. I mean, it, if you look at anyone who's gone through this false mantra, it, 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 it doesn't work. And if you just hold by the Bible and understand what the Bible says and follow it, you will succeed. Look what Donald Trump has done in, in only a year and a half's time. I mean, he's turned this country around economically as a foreign power, as his ability to influence around the world, and it's only because he's followed by these principles. And, and one of the things that really striked me, and this is something that, you know, keep it between the 40,000 people who are watching live right now, <laughs> is when you walk into the American ambassador, David Freeman's office in Jerusalem, when you walk in his office, the whole back wall is a painting. And the painting is the picture. It's, it's obvious when you see it. It's the picture of when the 12 spies come back from the land of Israel. And then you see Joshua and Caleb, the two spies, who said, we can do this. God is with us. We're going to do it. And then you see the 10 spies down uh, the mountain who are saying, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. We can't do this. Yeah. And, and I said to the, to the ambassador, why is this, you know, the centerpiece of your, it's a massive painting. Why is the U.S. ambassador, is this your painting? A and he said that that is what this administration's all about. We're going to be like the two spies that did what was right. Oh, I love that. Stuck with it, right. Even like though everyone says painting. we're like grasshoppers and there's going to be another intifada if we move the embassy and the Iranians and the Europeans are going to get us if we break the deal. And we're going to do what we know is right, what we were, we're right, and, and everything else is going to be okay because God's with us. And I think that is why, it, can you imagine how incredible it is that the president is consulting with 12 top pastors from America before he even makes this move? What, what a change. What a sea change in American policy. So I think that if you come with the Bible in hand, I think that that will be the most convincing argument to the people in the because they, they believe in that. They believe that that's the right way, and that's what mm -hmm. God wants. I'd like to get that painting. Amen. Yeah, me too. <laughs> There's not a lot to add. I think the message is to be consistent, stay strong, and stay true to what you know is true and to the, the, bibli to the biblical prophecies, which we know will come true, because that's what you've stood for until now, and that's what you should continue to stand for. And that should be the encouragement to the administration as well. It's hard to say uh, one, me one message, but uh, I will say that I think that first of all, the world should recognize that Israel went through so many uh, persecution, so many tragedy in our life, that once and for all, we don't need to justify ourselves all the time. We deserve to have our own country. Amen. The Arab nation around us have, I think, more over than 10 countries. Why we are not deserve to have our own homeland and live peacefully in, in the state of Israel? Second of all, you know, there is a famous sentence in Israel this, that says, as long as the gate for, um, uh, as long as Israel is alive, is open, the gate for Auschwitz will, be, will remain closed. So we have to keep Israel. Wow. It's safe for the world and for the Jewish people all over. I, well put. I think the image that I'm walking away from this is the image that you gave, Josh, is all the Arab nations surrounding Israel. Picture the size of a football field. And then Israel is a matchbook. And they're saying, we have all this, but you don't have any right 
to have that. And whether you like everything President Trump does or not, the one thing I love about him, and, and I feel the same way about President Net, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you know, um, when Prime Minister Netanyahu walks in, you feel like somebody's in charge. <laughs> it just feels like dad's here. It's going to be all right. I feel the same way with President Trump. I don't feel like Prime Minister Netanyahu can be bought off, and I know that President Trump can't be bought off. And when President Trump made that bold, historic move of moving the embassy to Jerusalem, people said it's going to be World War III. Nothing. Because when you do right, God stands with you. Would you give our guests a great big God bless? If you'll stand with Israel, stand with us right now and give these gentlemen from the land of Israel a great big God bless. Would you, one of you, whoever feels led, say a prayer over our congregation, a prayer over Tiz and I as we go to Washington Lord, we'd like to bless Pastor Larry, Tiz, the entire family, the entire ministries of New Beginnings Church, and all those out there watching and joining. God should continue to give you the strength, the moral clarity to stand up for what is true, to not be turned away or deceived by lies, to be, have the, the, the strength to stand against the tide, even when it's not popular, to stand up for what is true, for what God wants for all of his people and all of his creations on the world, and for fulfilling the prophecies for Israel and for all of our friends around the world. And may God bless us and protect us. Shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'higianu l'zman Amen. 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 God bless you. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about Bible prophecy. We'll see you then. Love somebody before you go. Amen. Amen.